Digital World Ember, where we interview people who are awesome, but not yet famous or famous enough. And uh, we discover their journeys with Ember, uh, what they do with it, and a little bit about them. So today we have Vinkat, and can you pronounce your last name for me? It's Dinavahi. Um, I usually don't bother when I'm like at the at the Starbucks. I just say Ven. All right. And usually they misspell it as Ben, like instead of V E N. But you know it works. So they got two out of twelve letters right. Yeah, it works. I get you know I get whatever I'm ordering. So you know I don't really care too much. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, see, I met you at EmberConf 2015, and like you were really gung ho about Ember, and you were training people in Ember. So, what we're going to talk about today? You've done some really cool stuff with Ember, like you've done some productivity apps, and you've done some outsourcing in a way that not many people would feel comfortable doing. So, I want to hear what you've done with that, and you've also recently doing some React work. I haven't been using React very much right now, but like a project that we're working on, a client. This is a client's application. I've been having to make modifications to their React app, and we're tasked with helping them outsource the React development because that's not their core competency. They want to right. They want someone to take this over. So yeah, I could speak about that a bit later. Yeah. So, so I guess it's more the difference between managing Ember people and managing React. A little bit of it is going to be uh, hypothetical because it's been so early. Like I would say we've been working with, I've been working on this React project for about two to three weeks and we have, we are trying out contractors on the React project right now. So I'll definitely have some thoughts on it, but definitely take it with a grain of salt. Hopefully I can come back and talk about React once we're further along as well. All right. Yeah. So uh, we can talk about that towards more towards the end of the podcast. And let's dive into uh, what you've been doing with Ember. So uh, you were doing a lot of stuff, like you had an agency and you were hiring out people in Eastern Europe, right? Yeah, Eastern Europe and, and South America. And how I got into Ember was my my co-founder at the time for the consultancy, uh, Coderly, he had a startup idea he wanted to work on and I was kind of interested in helping out there. It was called Cook Academy. I, I think it's it's still up. And he had picked Ember. I didn't know any, really know anything about Ember. Um, I at that time, I don't think even, I don't even know if Ember App Kit was out at that point. So that's really um, you're an OG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it had just come out around that time. So you know, I was trying to figure out what he had written, um, and I was learning about components. I I created my first component, which was like a video player. Uh huh. And I thought it was the coolest thing because it was almost just like, oh, I created t- a component with these tags, and now it's like a reasonable thing, just like, just like you uh-huh. have a, a select box or, or you know, an input element in HTML. Like now you can just reuse this thing everywhere, and yeah. that reusability really, really stuck with me. Like I didn't know much about the other portions of it, but I think that was like the shift. Like the first, it was like it being declarative with everything being data bound and just being able to create a component and easily drop it in anywhere. Like before that, I was coming from, you know, understand that I was coming from jQuery. So I guess I had kind of skipped over the whole backbone. (laughs) (laughs) I skipped over backbone as well because backbone is like just enough structure to confuse you. There was no routing. There was no, I wasn't really doing single page apps. And it might have been because, you know, like I think Backbone required you to string together a lot of things. Um, right. I don't like you have exactly. to manually set up and tear down views in Backbone uh-huh. and do your own routing. Yeah, I'd forgotten like how big a deal that was just being able to reuse stuff before the current wave of frameworks. Yeah, I guess maybe Backbone was kind of a, a stepping stone, right? Did Backbone right. have a, a router or? Uh, I didn't, I only did like half a project in Backbone. So I'm not the expert. And if I say a lot, everyone's just going to get mad. Uh huh. So if it had a router, it was very minimal. Okay, all right. Yeah. And uh-huh. the project might have been using actually the Ember router that I was working on. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, you know that library they released as just like, look, Ember has tiny packages too. We were using that. Which uh, which one? Uh, it was something to do with Ember routing. So, like, you know how we've got, like, Backburner and RSVP as tiny libraries? There's yeah, yeah. one of that for a lot of the routing functionality as well. 
Oh, so, yeah, I didn't know. So this was before Router was part of Ember? or Oh, no, it's uh, it was originally a monolithic thing, and then they pulled mm. it out. And it's actually still pulled out like that. It's just a uh, library that... It might be just router.js on the tilde IO. Yes. Oh, so you mean before... Are you saying before you made your foray into Ember, you were using the router.js that was used in Ember? That was a project that I got stuck working on. So, like, they didn't want Ember because it was too large. So Uh, we just took Backbone and, like, we couldn't do without the router because it's so hard to build something without a good router. It's like, all right, this is just a tiny micro library we can handle having this yeah i i do i do feel that a little too much emphasis gets put on you know the the footprint of the library um yeah. especially like how much is ember when like zipped like when it's gzipped and everything sent on the wire i actually don't know off the top of my head maybe we can it is 1.6 megabytes now that's actually smaller than i thought i thought it was going to be 3.5 what about compressed down? Is that uh, that's production or? minimized? The debug oh, one see. might be the one that's three point five. Now the debug is only one point seven. Interesting. They really shaved off a lot. I know they were trying to work on reducing the file size in the recent builds. I didn't know it was that effective. Yeah, I remember. I remember the project I most most recently worked on. One of the other developers on on the project, he was basically requiring things individually. You're not there was no it was no longer require Ember. It was like what require Ember slash you know route, right? Or Ember slash right. uh, component. Uh huh. Um, Ember slash RSVP. Um, I don't. I, th- I think they had to actually shim that. But basically, what he told me is that. They they plan to like shake out like the parts of the, or the code base that aren't actually being used. Yeah. And so if you're only using a small percentage of Ember, like it'll only I, it, include that. It'll only include that. Yeah. Isn't the name they give that Svelte builds? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I was homeschooled, so I pronounce everything wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard the term, but yeah. Yeah, so, uh, right, when you got started with Ember, you were, like, it was the simple things that, like, just being able to reuse code. Yeah, exactly. It was just, like, having, like, you could now take in a a design or, like, a concept and say, all right, that's a component, that's a component, okay, we need a video component that does this, this, and this, and now suddenly you've decomposed your app into a bunch of these components, and that was amazing to me coming from spaghetti code, like, on DOM document ready, like attach this plugin here and that <laughs> plugin there, and then like listen for events and like work. Like it was just a complete mess before that. And yeah. I mean, I was coming from, and it might have been what kept me from going into front end development for so long. Cause up till that point, I had been strictly, like almost strictly back end. Like I was just building APIs. Like, yeah. In fact, I think Josh was kind of like dealing with all the front end stuff and for the most part. And I was dealing with infrastructure and, and Rails, Rails APIs and everything. So that was actually not only my foray into Ember, that was also almost my foray into the front end. I, I mean, the last time I had done front end was using, a, it's called Sencha the, now. Back then it was called XJS. And this was uh-huh. in college and it was very, very complicated and very painful. And, I, and then so after that, it was just like, you know, do jQuery plugins here and there, like writing a my own but there was not there was i i was i had not built a significant application so what you're saying is ember changed your life oh totally yeah <laughs> <laughs> life was never the same there was like before ember and then there was after ember yes and during ember do during ember yeah which is continuing like i so right now i'm not using ember but i do plan to you know use it for at, at my next opportunity yes yeah whenever there's a chance yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know for a while, like, I wasn't able to do Ember full time. And I think my Twitter bio actually read Ember when I can. <laughs> <laughs> and we're lucky that now that can be a lot more than it used to be. Yeah, now it can be Ember because I can, right? Yeah, because I can do a lot more with Ember. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about productivity and outsourcing. Because I know those are two things that you're really excited about. Yeah, sure. Productivity in in what sense? Are you talking about like developer productivity? Right, because or... uh, your business and well, go ahead and tell me about your business. 
we're a pre-product right now. Uh-huh. So we're working on building more intelligent collaboration tools for teams. Because what, what happens is like if you've ever worked, especially on a remote team, you have GitHub notifications, you have Asana tasks, people are emailing you about things, they're slacking you, you have to set up meetings and calendar invites and stand up. So there's a lot of these things that you, um, among all this noise and all these services, there's like things you have to do. Like there's that list of things that you have to sit down at the beginning of the day and you have to go through that list. You have to respond to that email. You have to review that pull request. You have to schedule that meeting. So you have tasks in like eight different places. Yeah, you have them in all you have them all over the place and not all of them are tasks. Sometimes it's like here's your receipt for, you know, signing up for this like membership club and like here's like somebody just sent a giphy in Slack. So it's like not <laughs> all things that need to get done. So like what we were trying what we really wanted to do is help these teams like wrangle this problem of of like being overwhelmed by information, but not being able to have a simple list of what to do. It's kind of, we've kind of like lost sight of that. So what we want to do is for now, build an, an intelligent inbox that can pull in all this information from these different services that you're using and figure out what you need to act on and prioritize that based on like what's most important. So if something, if the server is crashing, then we want to be able to figure out that, you know, that's more urgent than, you know, changing the font type on the, on the about us page and push that up to the top. So we're working with a company, we're working with a company right now for a year and they're paying us to help them get organized. So it's, it's a great opportunity for us to, you know, learn about the problem and dog food, you know, whatever, whatever we build. Yeah. And then like, once you are done working with them, you can start showing it to other companies. Exactly. So for now, it's just going to be us using it within our team and then them using it within their team. Yeah. So it's going to be like perfect for you guys. And then you start expanding it. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Like nail one use case. Yeah, and we were thinking of, of you know, we were really thinking at first of, oh, should we go get funding and then go build this thing? But, you know, the problem is, and this kind of ties into productivity a bit, the problem is, like, it's very easy to be busy, right? So working, you can be working 80 hours a week building the wrong thing, right? So, like, I think the the, the definition of productivity is very important because, If you define productivity like how quickly you can get stuff done, the 80 hour a week person who's building the wrong thing is now productive, you know, and he feels productive and he's checking things off his list. He's, you know, refactoring code, you know, but if nobody wants to buy that thing or whatever he's built, then was he really productive? You know, so I I mean, I kind of define productivity as um, how quickly you can like how quickly you can go get to the right outcome that you want. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily the number of check boxes you make. It's the distance you get to the right point B. It's making sure that point B is correct. Mm -hmm. And a a lot of times it's not engineering, you know, so it's like, I can give you an example with this company. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to keep their name anonymous, but when we came in, not everybody was was on the same page. And so the developers were getting tasks coming from five different people. So one person would request this feature, another person would request another feature. And it turned out that when we really dug into why they wanted to build this, the, this, ver- this particular version of the app, it was for demo purposes, okay? Because they wanted their sales team to be able to go and take this and put it in front of customers to sign deals so that could they could build out something full featured, um, which when you looked at this backlog of things that was being worked on, a lot of it didn't really need to be there for the demo. It didn't affect the demo. So what we had to do was we had to create a, we basically created a demo script. We had the sales team create a demo script and they wrote the step-by-step, you know, script of what they were going to present to the customer and everything, you know, so what's being worked on now is everything in the backlog that ties into that is is going to stay in there for this, like, milestone. Everything else is going to be pushed off. Yeah, so the script is almost like a giant cucumber test. Exa- exactly, yeah. Yeah, so your goal is to turn that green. Yeah, and I would always urge, like, if 
if you're a developer, it's it's very easy to get caught in the let me just you know they, here's the here's the, what they asked for. Let me just you know chug away and, and build it. But you're are you being productive, right? If right. they're giving you the wrong thing, or if they give you if they if they ask you for one thing but they really need another thing. Yeah, it's sort of like the video game mentality where like you're given a set of objectives and you just meet those objectives. Like in a video game, you're never given the wrong objectives. Yeah, uh-huh. Which is part of what makes them so great. Yeah. <laughs> but in the real world, you have to like push back and see what the actual objectives are. Yeah. And I would urge like, you know, if you're getting feature sets or or specs coming over coming sent over to you um always like always ask why like why do you want this feature why do you want that feature right the mental image i'm getting is a checklist for a chess game where it's like capture rook check Uh uh-huh gain control of center check Uh uh-huh and all those things are good but the actual goal is to checkmate the king Mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter like whichever those sub goals you need to do checkmate the king that's the ones you do uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. It. I guess in this, the question of why, I think it applies up and down the stack. So it applies when uh, a div, uh, somebody's asking you for a feature, and when they've written out this documentation for a feature they want. It applies at like you know the code level. Like if you're writing this line of code, you're like, why should this line of code exist? You know, and then it exists so this method can be used in this context. Um, and why does that method need to be used? Oh, it's for that API endpoint. Why does that API endpoint need to be used? Um, it's for the front end because they want to display this chart on the screen. Why does that chart need to exist? So, I mean, of course, it it could be like you know debilitating if you're every like every minute asking that. <laughs> but like, it's good to try to start thinking from that perspective of going top down and like why something happens. You know, it, it's it's kind of like how test driven you know, development works where like you write an integration test and, you know, because that that's like the high level. Right. So you start with the things that are easily grokkable by humans and you slowly turn that into code. Uh huh. And as long as you start with the right things for the humans, then you're going to end up somewhere fairly good. Exactly. And, And if you're wrong, like, and in this chain of like, like imagine this chain, like you, you have a, you, you have this thing you need to work on. And then one level up, you have the reason you need to work on, like you have the method and then you have like the object that's being used and you have the API call and it goes up and up and up. Right. And if, if at any point that is wrong, like if you're building the chart, but the chart doesn't have a good reason to exist, None of that below it matters, right? Like the the API call didn't matter, the React component didn't matter, Ember component, whatever it is, the all the way down. Um, so that's why if you don't ask that constantly, you're gonna end up working on the wrong thing, and you're not gonna be productive. So if you're gonna make a mistake, make a mistake in the code rather than in the motivation, because it's easier to fix. Yeah, yeah. The higher up the mistake, I would say, the bigger the implications are. Um, like if your if your mistake is at the level of our company is building the wrong product. Now you're scrapping all everything, right? If like it's at the level of the feature, you're just throwing out that feature and, and uh, so on and, and so forth. So uh, do you help people find their target market as well? Because I mean, that's the highest level. That hasn't really been our in our, our focus. I, I we do I think we do help we do help some with like getting them to ask the right questions. Like what does the customer we might ask what does the customer think about this? Right. Um, if they don't know, then, you know, they're, they, it's, you know, they're, it's in their, the ball's in their court to go ask the customer. But we thought, we thought we really want to just focus on productivity at the level of building like a software product or building an application. And one way you can do that, uh, more productivity per dollar is to hire people from other countries where the cost of living is lower. And uh-huh. can you tell me more about your experience doing that? We started. We started doing this back when we were when I was at when I was at Coderly. We had we we started outsourcing things initially, and we ran into uh, at first it was great because our first hires were like South in South America, so same time zone. And Josh and I were also coding a lot at the time. Yeah. So it was all hands on deck. We're all in, we're all in hip chat. That's what we, we were using then. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> 
it's like if you need something, you ping someone. If, if he has some code he wants you to look at um, or there's an unclear requirement, they, they'll ping you right away, right? Which was great, but what happened was a few projects later, we didn't have enough time in the day to handle all the coding ourselves. So we, were, we, were, we had to become more hands-off. Also, like we, were, we would hire people in Eastern Europe. Like we had a developer in Croatia. And because of the time zone issue, like so what that means is if something is unclear, then you lose a lot. You lose a day because like, he asks right. you a question, you're asleep. You ch- you check back and you haven't answered the question. He's been twiddling his thumbs, or he he tried to work on something less important. So I think it was almost like a it was almost like a good problem to have because we had issues that weren't like exposed because we were on the same time zone and constantly all working together. Right. So unwritten things that were a problem, but because you had this secret knowledge, yeah. uh, tribal knowledge, not secret. Yeah, tribal knowledge, and we didn't have to be clear up front because if we were unclear, the cost of being unclear was very low because they could just they could just come back to us immediately. Right. So what we realized is how important it is to have clear requirements. So that's that. I guess that's that was the big that was a big thing. Like if like I think a lot of people have trouble running when they when they outsource because it's an open ended thing. They give them an open ended task, and this might just be my experience, but I've found that you know, especially working in you know some other like your Eastern European countries, they're amazing engineers out there. Um, a lot of them, maybe it's cultural. They don't deal w- as well with ambiguity or some of the decision making and reading between the lines. That. I mean, it's, that's a generalization. Definitely worked with people across the spectrum here also. Yeah, I was about to say, I've worked with people here who also have uh-huh. that. <laughs> so so it's, this is a, a, I think it's a universal thing of like, if you're outsourcing something to someone, you're not, you, and especially if there's not a constant back and forth. Right. And if there's a, if they're from a different culture, like in America, there are some things we don't say, but we have a similar enough culture that we can still pick up on some of those. Uh-huh. and make guesses about what's needed. But like if someone from China was hiring me to make an app, like I don't know what Chinese people like in their apps. Mm-hmm. Whereas I can make a fairly good guess about what American people like in their apps. Yeah, that was a big one. And coming back to the why, it, it really helps when you give a task to someone mm-hmm. to give them some context. So you you don't just give them the task, you give them the why of the task and maybe the why of that. So for example, like the app that we're building now, our developers know that it's only going to be used by ourselves and one other company because we want to test it out. What that lets them do is they can make that allows them to make decisions on their own. They can say, OK, we don't need to worry about performance right now because it's only going to be used by 10 people. Like if an animation is is expensive to build, let's leave that out because they're not going to care about these things right now. Right. It's an internal tool. Exactly. Versus if we just focused on here are the exact requirements, they have to read them between the lines and they can't be empowered to just go figure, you know, just while you're asleep, they'll go make all these decisions on their own as they as they run into roadblocks. Right. It sounds like the sweet spot is giving them the big why and then giving mm-hmm. them some fairly specific instructions to go along. Exactly. With that. Exactly. And Ember. OK. And Ember was great for this because what had happened was I was built I, I built a wireframing tool in Ember. It's collecting dust right now, but at the, at the time it was an idea I had. And I, I needed help I needed to build more components. Like like I had I had these date pickers you could draw and, and other things, but there's such a big library of uh, components I needed I wanted to build. And outsourcing that became fairly easy because ember has a very defined way of doing things you go into an ember project and you're like okay i know okay these are the the components are going to be here the routes are going to be here and and so on and so forth you can almost look at an app and kind of guess what's going to be where you can almost be like okay these are components i'm sure like these routes are going to be here and and uh yeah like and that's definitely true for like even as your project gets huge, like I'm working on an app, which is the biggest I've seen. And I was able to be productive within a day mm-hmm. because of all that structure. Yeah. So now, and, and, yeah, and that, that's, that's definitely true. And like, I, I've 
def- I've had instances where we had multiple people working on the same Ember project, and because everything had a place, just made it so much quicker to to onboard people. So right now um, we have it was a very tough choice. Like our our developers now who are working on our product, they really wanted to use React, and I wanted them to use Ember. At the end of the day, I conceded to them because I was like, you know, like you guys are doing it. I'm barely going to be touching the app at this point. So I want you guys to work with what makes you happy working with. And, you know, React isn't a bad choice. It wasn't like we want to use, they're like, they weren't like, we want to use jQuery. If they had said <laughs> that, that would have been a different conversation. But it was like good versus, you know. Good versus better. Are you guys using Redux as well? They they do want to use Redux, yes. Um, so that was another thing. So they it seemed like they had kn- they knew all the best practices. Uh huh. It simulate an Ember in their head. Exactly. But the, so the challenge there is that like because these guys they're they're really good at what they do and they they know they have the best practices. They 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 know web Webpack works really well with with the build system like so they set all of that up and it's all very meticulous and very well put together but if i go to another react app and case in point like the react app that you know our client is using uh has right that it's it's got a, quite a bit of technical debt there is no there's no there's some standard but there's not like things don't have a place now they wish they want to have that now they want to have um routes you know they don't have routes and like okay Let's okay, great. Let's put a router in there. But you know, if a beginner in Ember, you know, who doesn't have, who has very little experience, is just going to have routes out of the box. They're not yeah. even thinking about the best practice of should each page have a URL? Should the state be stored in the URL? They just follow the directions and they right. and, they and making not- different pages in Ember is absurdly easy. Yeah, exactly. I would say that you know anything you can do in Ember, you can also do in React. But the lack of, of standards and like bundling things together has a cost. And that cost is, and I think, you know, Tom Dale and Yehuda Katz mentioned this, it's everybody builds their own like kind of framework. And- right. <laughs> and then you don't have a good upgrade path either. Because like, yeah, it- as annoying as upgrading Ember is, there's a path. Yeah. And like when you're done with that path, you will be on the latest and greatest and have all the best practices. Uh huh. And especially if developers come and go, it's like now we have some institutional knowledge of how the framework is set up. We could document it, but at the same time, it's it's a painful thing to to get onboarded to. Like we, when I looked at this app, I saw so I saw the tabs. I saw the tabs on the left, and then I saw the chart in the middle, and then like things at the bottom. And like if if this was Ember, I would have been thinking, okay, like so these are going to be links, and then this is an outlet in the center, and then um, this is a component, and the, like yeah. let me look at Ember data and see where the data is coming from. And it's I'm not saying it's perfect, right? I'm, I think you know there's a lot of kinks that still need to be worked out, and there's a lot of things that need to be simplified. But I think I personally would take standards over, you know, handcrafting a better framework, you know. And the odds that the handcrafted better framework stays better, even if it starts out better for your purpose, is extremely small. It's, yeah, especially when developers are coming and going. Like, they're going to have interns working on this. And the interns aren't just going to, if the interns are in Ember, they do the Ember way, right? If they learn React, it's like, okay, well, oh, it looks like we should use Flux, right? Yeah. Who's um, so, React? Well, yeah. So it, it it's like, okay, we need we should use Flux. Okay, and Flux is this pattern in React, and it's support. There's multiple libraries in Flux. It's similar to Node.js, right? Like, and when when I tried Node, it was like, okay, let's like, what library should I use for database access, and what should I use for this, and what should I use for that, and then so now I find myself like piecing these things together, unsure of what the community has converged on, spending time on that instead of building an application. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So you're going to have to maintain this application for years, right? Yeah. We'll we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you're going to be on this probably longer than your developers. Exactly. Yeah. So... This this is something that's that's that was a big uh, consideration in that. What went into the final decision was okay. You know what? Like because our front end is fairly simple, like compared to like our a lot of our not like a lot of the intelligence is going into the back end algorithms. Right. So, 
And once you find the thing, it's easy to rebuild it in something else. Yeah, so if it comes down to it, we'll throw it out and we'll rebuild it. Yeah. If the front end had been the bulk of the work, it would have been a much, much harder decision to make. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, that's good to hear about your experience with that, since you've been on both sides of the coin. That's yeah, probably not the um, exact right expression. Both sides of the <laughs> river, both sides of the fence. Yeah, but yeah, I guess both sides of the fence is, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, so you know where the grass really is greener. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I'll be more certain of it as, you know, things, uh, as time progresses. Right, as you gain more experience with React. Mm -hmm. But my sense is the lack of uh, the community converging around a set of things to use uh -huh. is making it, it will make it difficult for adoption. If I had some feedback, you know, for that community, it would be to start at least designating things as, you know, the officially supported uh, this this is the officially supported router. This is the officially supported uh, flux layer because choice choice comes at a cost. You know, right. choice comes at the cost of you know making it difficult to under things difficult to understand. Paral analysis by paralysis, like mm -hmm. instead of building and switching an app, costs, switching costs. Yeah. So yeah, that's good to hear. All right. Yeah. Thank you for coming and talking to us today. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Is there anything else you want to tell people? Uh, are you hiring? Um, this might be blasphemy, but they are looking for a, a React developer. <laughs> All right. So if you're for some reason yeah, listening to Real World Ember and you want a React job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you have any Angular jobs you want to advertise? <laughs> jQuery. We're looking for a jQuery and PHP developer. But, uh, <laughs> but well-structured jQuery. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's that's funny, but I do. I somebody is looking for a PHP developer. But <laughs> it happens. No, it, uh, I. Good luck to them for finding uh, for finding one. But. <laughs> All right, awesome. Yeah, and uh, we might check back in with you in a year or so with the show when you're ready to uh, start expanding the number of companies who can use your software. Yeah, that'd be, it'd be great to come back and talk about it. Awesome. Well, I'll talk to you then. All right, great. All right, see ya. This is the end of the show, but here's a message from our sponsor. Our sponsor who happens to be me. So I run emberscreencast.com. If you're an intermediate level developer, then this site is for you. So you've read your introductory book and you're ready to get started, but you're not quite into reading the source code yet. So I go and I explain some of the basics, but I also explain cool add-ons, and some intermediate to advanced topics as well. So go ahead and check out emberscreencast.com. Two screencasts released every week for the intermediate Ember developer. I hope to see you there.